Ooh. Ooh. I'm breathing hard. I have this heavy bag outside my office. My I used to have a rule where I do jumping jacks. If I've been kind of sitting around for more than an hour, I get up and do 100 jumping jacks. Now I hit the heavy bag fast as I can, as hard as I can, 100 times. And I come back in here into my office and I record podcasting magic for you. In this case, very magical. We're talking to a 30-year-old scientist phenom who runs a 230 marathon. He deadlifts 420 pounds and he drinks, of all things, hydrogen-enriched water. You don't know what that is? You're about to learn. Uh, This podcast, uh, speaking of cool things, is uh, brought to you by this brand new, incredible bicycle that I own. This is not a bicycle that I ride to the grocery store. This thing actually sits in my house, and it allows me to get live-streamed classes from a New York City studio, any type of classes that I want. Now, bicycling, as you may or may not know, is a fantastic way to not just burn calories, but you generate a huge amount of mitochondria. You can do crazy high-intensity interval workouts on it. With this new program, I can do 20-minute burns. I can do hip-hop. I can do rock and roll, low-impact, high-intensity I've got over 8,000 on-demand classes that I can do, and I can ride live with other people. It's called a Peloton. It's this cutting-edge indoor cycling bike that brings these live studio classes right into your home, or in my case, behind me in my office. It's got a 22-inch HD touchscreen, this super silent belt drive, so it's really quiet, so I can actually hear the workouts that I'm doing, not like a super loud indoor trainer, like a lot of these things are, and a tiny little compact two-by-four-foot footprint, so you can put it anywhere, living room, basement, office, bedroom, behind your refrigerator, you name it. Um, so, they're giving all of you a limited time offer to get your own Peloton. Well worth it. Uh, here's how. You go to onepeloton.com. Let me spell that out for you. One, O-N-E, Peloton, P-E-L-O-T-O-N.com. Onepeloton.com. And you get $100 off any accessories with your Peloton bike purchase. And a great workout at home anytime you please. No driving to the gym. OnePeloton.com, use the code Greenfield, and yeah, you do this at home, but you aren't lonely on your spin bike because you can be with a whole bunch of other people. You just plug into other people, do the workout with them. It's amazing. Check it out. Uh, This podcast is also brought to you by Movement Watches, and uh, they've sold over a million watches now, and the reason for that is these things look uh, they, they look super stylish. They're minimalists. Uh, I've got four of them, actually. I can rotate between my white one. I've got this jet black one. Uh, my wife has this, this white one that I think looks super hot on her wrist. They've got fashion-forward bracelets they just added to their collection in uh, classic cuffs and trendy barbed wire designs, finishes like gold and rose gold and matte black, and you name it. Uh, those are just uh, 40 bucks. And the watches themselves look like these super expensive Rolodexes, but you get them for pennies on the dollar. And they even have these custom new Valentine's Day boxes where you get a watch and a bracelet. And there's nothing better than opening up what you thought was just a bracelet and getting a watch too, or vice versa. So Valentine's Day is just around the corner. This is perfect for Valentine's Day. Perfect. Uh, And there's still time to get it. Uh, 15% off. 15% 15% off these movement watches. You just go to mvmt.com slash Ben. That gives you free shipping and free returns. mvmt.com slash Ben. All right, let's go chat with Tyler. In this episode of the Ben Group from Fitness Show. It's hydrogen gas. I mean, this is the jet fuel that you're talking about, or rocket fuel, really, right? You have hydrogen, oxygen, they combust together. You make water. Hydrogen is three times more energy dense than gasoline. This is the molecular hydrogen we're talking about. Powers the sun, powers the cars, also powers the body, right? Really, if we look at the metabolic pathways that hydrogen activates and exercise activates, and we do some parallels, we do some, we do some correlations here, we see exercise can activate, say, CERT-3 expression, which is amazing for exercise, so can hydrogen. He's an expert in human performance and nutrition. Voted America's top personal trainer and one of the globe's most influential people in health and fitness. His show provides you with everything you need to optimize physical and mental performance. He is Ben Greenfield. Power. Speed. Mobility. Balance. Whatever it is for you that's the natural movement. Get out there. When you look at all the studies done, studies that have shown the greatest efficacy. 
All the information you need in one place, right here, right now, on the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. Hey folks, it's Ben Greenfield, and my guest on today's podcast is kind of a phenom. He was introduced to me by Dr. Joseph Mercola, uh, who happens to be one of the more popular docs who I've ever had on this show. And um, Dr. Mercola filled me in on this guy and on the concept that we're going to talk about today, which is molecular hydrogen. Not as boring as you might think. It's actually really interesting stuff. Uh, and his name is Tyler LeBaron. Tyler, am I pronouncing your name right? Is it LeBaron or LeBaron or LeBaron? Depends. I mean, pas le français, LeBaron, but Le Baron. just LeBaron. All right. Yeah, le, le, yeah, LeBaron. All right, LeBaron, which is French for the bear. I'm just going to make that up. Yeah, or um, the man. We'll, we'll roll with it, dude. So Tyler's 30 years old. Um, he's run a 230 marathon. You can de- what, what do you deadlift, dude? Like 450 pounds? You know that, yeah. I that's you know, four hundred and twenty is my right. is my max. Doc, Doctor McCullough told me four fifty ish, so I, we're in the ballpark. I, you know, and I told him, don't don't be just saying things that aren't true. He also said I was doing a two. No, that's what I would like to do. Yeah. So. Well, you're trying to qualify for the trials, right? Well, I would, you know, I would like to see if I could make that qualifying time. That would be pretty sweet. Yeah. It would be. And you're one smart cookie. So listen to this, folks. Tyler is the founder and executive director of the Molecular Hydrogen Foundation. He has a degree in biochemistry. He interned at Nagoya University in Japan in the Department of Neurogenetics to research the mechanisms of hydrogen gas on cell signaling pathways. Uh, He's the director of the International Hydrogen Standards Association, the International Molecular Hydrogen Association. Let's see how many times I can say hydrogen. Uh, He speaks around the world at different medical conferences, specifically on biomedical hydrogen and the use of hydrogen and hydrogen research. And uh, he studied everything, physiology and exercise physiology and nutritional biochemistry, molecular cell biology, quantitative chemical analysis, biology analysis techniques. And he has researched just as many things from vitamins and minerals and nutraceuticals to biological and chemical properties of creatine, therapeutic uses of exercise for disease prevention and treatment to free radical biology and medicine, which we'll delve into today whole host of topics. But you know what's most interesting, Tyler? What's that? You you studied at Nagoya University? Well, yeah, for my internship, I, I you know that's kind of the epicenter of a lot of the hygiene research. And so I had the opportunity to go down there and, and actually do the research, you know, in 2013 and really get involved in it. Yeah. You know, what's crazy about that is I used to go to Nagoya every year to race in the Ironman triathlon that they used to have over there in Nagoya. Oh, Hondo Deska. Yeah, I'd fly into Centra Air, Airport. You know that airport? Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And the triathlon's like literally like right across the street. It was amazing. I'd go there and just like stuff my face with sushi and get amazing massages, visit some Japanese saunas, do the triathlon, take the bullet train over to Kyoto, hang out in Kyoto, and then fly home. It was like one of the one of the funnest things I'd do every year. Amazing. <laughs> You're one oh, that's of that's awesome. I just barely got back from Nagoya weeks ago. Most people go to Tokyo or Kyoto, but uh, I, I kind of like that area right now around Nagoya. A lot of people, um, a lot of people don't even realize they have this amazing airport that you can fly into at a lot of times, a lot lower cost than even um, Tokyo or Kyoto. So yeah, uh, interesting. Native. So um, before we even delve into molecular hydrogen, man, I'm, I'm curious about your training protocol because not a lot of people can deadlift over 400 pounds and run a 2:30 marathon. I'm I'm just curious how you how you're able to lift heavy and run as fast as you do in an endurance sport. <laughs> yeah, they are kind of a diametrically opposed, you know, uh, training. Um, but I think that's the first thing is most people don't train that way, and, and you can. Mo- most people, if they're runners, they just first off, most people who run don't lift any weights at all, and then those that do typically lift just very light weight and lots and lots of reps. And conversely, those people who are lifting the heavy weights or something, uh, they don't run a lot. 
And I, I, you know, my goal has just been, I want to be strong. I don't care about being huge and, you know, doing things for hypertrophy and have big muscles or things. I just, I like to, I want to be strong. So I would lift heavy weights and that's the most important uh, way to get stronger, to induce that, that stimuli for, you know, the central, central nervous system and everything to actually lift more weights because the correlation between hypertrophy and strength is not as strong as uh, most people think that it is. So I guess when it comes to my training for for weightlifting, uh, it really is focusing on lifting heavy, more like a power lifter. So w- when you do that, are you doing like concurrent training? Meaning, are you? Um, oh yeah. W- when you go to the to the weight room, are you doing like running followed by powerlifting or weight training, and then back to running? Or are you completely separating your aerobic training and your strength training? It, it doesn't matter as long as I'm doing both. It's it's fine. And I'll just go, I'll just, for example, I'll, I'll have a focus. So let's say my focus is on strength training. I want to get my bench press up, my deadlift up, you know, whatever up as high as I can. That's my primary focus. That's what I do first. That's what I'll do, say, in the morning or something. And then for running, I'm just doing high intensity intervals. I'm just staying in the best shape that I can. And then after I kind of start getting tired or plateauing a little bit of the of the heavy weights and things and I'm just I'm looking for a little change and I, w- I want to get back into the running I just switch them a little bit just you know like a teeter totter just kind of lopsided a little bit more and I'll start focusing a lot more on the running getting in more distance getting in more uh in, intense training th- times and just and then kind of maintain the weights and I'll just keep on going back and forth back and forth and you know, then changing. If I'm going to go for a competition for weightlifting, I'm focusing on that. And then, oh, marathon's coming up. I want to focus on on this. So, so that's kind of how 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 I do it. So I I try to train both of them every day. Um, but as long as I'm doing them both at the same time, whether in the same day or in the same training session, it it, it doesn't matter. I like to do it different times of the day because that way I can get some recovery in. Um, before I go do my next bout of exercise, I want to be as much recovered as I can so that I can get a good uh, exercise session in. Yeah, that's that's interesting. So even though you're you're specifically focusing focusing on a certain at a certain time of year on strength or on endurance, you're still all year long training both strength and endurance in the same training cycle. Yeah, one I'm trying to maintain, not necessarily trying to improve, just trying to really maintain. I mean, we look at the studies in the VO2 max, for example, going out and doing a few bouts of high intensity exercise a few times a week can really maintain your VO2 max uh, pretty well, um, as opposed to the uh, enormous amount of time is required to improve uh, your your VO2 max. Yeah, that's really interesting. Are you, are you following any kind of special diet or do you use any special you know, biohacks or anything like that and any little secrets that you have up your sleeve as an, as a scientist? Maybe. <laughs> I, I, you know, sometimes I tell people what I do and they're like, wow, that's amazing. That's such a good idea. But I, but to me, I think, well, that's what else would you do? Eat, right. You know, for, for example, I do eat as healthy as I can. I, I really stay away from just refined sugars and, and carbohydrates. Not, not necessarily saying they're just bad, bad, but there is, there is, good, better, and best, right? And there's better choices, better options. And so I, you know, try to eat clean and that in those regards. And then my the timing of nutrition I think is important. You know, for example, when do you take your protein? Uh which protein do you take? Well like for for me, I, I don't take that much protein at all. Um in fact most of the time I don't take any protein because I just try to eat well. But you know, we if we look at the research, we know that only, you know, 20 to 30 uh, grams of, of protein is really all, all you really need. And primarily, it's uh, the BCAAs that we that we need anyway, specifically leucine. So, you know, 20 to 30 grams of protein, um, you're, get, you're getting most of your benefits. But for me, like if I'm hungry, then I'll take protein before I go work out. And, t- and take a look at the research on protein supplementation before a workout. It's It's amazing. So if I'm hungry... Before I work out, I'll take protein. If I'm not hungry because I just ate a couple hours ago, then I'll go work out. And as soon as I'm done, then I'll take protein. But unless I'm really training, trying to get to that that next level and kind of plateauing or something, I, I usually don't even take protein. That's interesting. And that's also interesting what you said about BCAAs because I actually don't really use BCAAs. Um, there, there's some, some really interesting studies on uh, depletion of some of the vitamin Bs with use of BCAAs and some 
some pretty extreme glycemic variability with uh, with the high doses of leucine and then some neurotransmitter issues. I, I just wrote an article about this. I, I'm a way bigger fan of essential amino acids, and I, I'll use those, you know, like, for example, uh, before or during and after training session for, for a very similar effect, but you kind of kind of blunt some of the negative effects of BCAAs with uh, with like an essential amino acid. Are you familiar with any of that research on BCAAs? Oh, well, I am. I'm not familiar with that research you're talking about. I mean, leucine is essential for the stimulation of mTOR, and, and that in, in, is very anabolic. And some of the research I saw a while ago was suggesting that the primary benefit of taking a whey protein or, or or different BCAs in general was because of the benefits of leucine specifically. Now I do agree, and I understand just just based on you know common biochemistry principles that taking levels of too much of one specific amino acid can certainly cause problems. And so for me, I I actually will will, will first take protein, then if I'm going to the next level, e, uh, the EAAs, the essential amino acids, and then if I'm looking to for serious competition, I just really want extra push, then I'll look at supplementing in just pure BCAAs or maybe just focus on leucine. And that's for a very short t- time period. I'm not talking about chronic supplementation for months on end, just just for a short t- period to get me to that, that next level. Right. You're looking for a pretty extreme anabolic effect. I guess I was more referring to, to some of the issues people experience with, with metabolic issues with BCAAs. But I, the other thing is like, I personally like EAAs just because a lot of times I'm competing in endurance sports. So I'm trying to avoid sure, too much sure. catabolism. So I'm trying to flood my bloodstream yeah. with, with as many amino acids as I need for, for repair post-workout. But then also because uh, central nervous system fatigue can be a big issue during endurance sports, the, the EAAs keep a lot of tryptophan from kind of flooding the blood-brain barrier, which which the BCAAs don't do quite as well a job of. So I, so it kind of keeps me from bonking during the longer longer endurance sessions. So I'll have, to, I'll have to look into that. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I should I should send you um I'll get your address later and I'll send you a bottle of this stuff that I use for the uh, for the amino acids. Like I it's like freaking it's jet fuel. But uh but we're here to we're here to talk about a different kind of jet fuel, man. Um this, yeah, this whole right. concept <laughs> of, of molecular hydrogen. Uh so I guess let's just start here. Like what what is molecular hydrogen? Yeah, so it's just it's hydrogen gas. I mean, this is the jet fuel that you're talking about, or rocket fuel, really, right? You have hydrogen, oxygen, they combust together. You make water, but the combustion, it's it's, it's amazing. It, hydrogen is three times more energy dense than gasoline. So this is the molecular hydrogen we're talking about. Powers the sun, powers the cars, also powers the body, right? Uh, we, we well, it's not an energy source to the body, but in in the sense that it does. Uh, have some really neat therapeutic and medical effects that we're really just recently finding out. One of the first publications on uh, the hydrogen could give therapeutic effects was actually in 1975 by uh, Texas A&M and Baylor University, and they published a report in, in the Journal of Science, uh, one of the top journals out there, But and they used a hyperbaric hydrogen chamber in an animal model of melanoma tumors, and they found that the, the this distreatment at very high pressure of hydrogen could basically uh, reduce the melanoma tumors and was was really remarkable in its therapeutic uh, applications. But it's not you know if you think about you know the the actual utilization or application of a hyperbaric chamber in normal life uh, in our in clinical practice that so it's it's not it's not too easy to do. So I think that's why. Not much research was done until 2007 when uh, there was an article published in the very prestigious journal Nature Medicine. And in that article, they found that hydrogen was very neuroprotective and prevented the toxic damage from ischemia or perfusion injury that was induced via middle cerebral artery occlusion in a rat model. Okay. And basically, okay. when this happens, when you have this hypoxia or this you know, low, low blood flow to the brain and different things, you cause lots of free radicals, lots of oxidative stress, and that ends up causing necrosis and, and cell death and all these different problems. And hydrogen gas was very effective at preventing that from happening. And it was done at a very low concentration, only you know 2 to 3%, which is below the flammability level. It has to be higher than 4.6% to be explosive. And so now okay. we can see that hydrogen gas could actually be utilized in a clinical setting because it's not flammable. And, and, and now, 10 years later, 
we're, the Japanese government has now approved hydrogen inhalation as an official medical procedure for post-cardiac arrest patients because they're finding that it's, it's actually more effective than conventional treatments uh, like hypothermia. Because, see, when, you, when the heart stops, it's not, it's not so difficult to get the heart started again. You get the heart started again, but then a lot of people die shortly after because when that blood goes throughout the rest of the body and hits the brain, that, that blast of oxygen and oxygenated blood to everything starts causing this cascade of all this radical damage and oxidative. So administration of hydrogen gas is able to help attenuate and mitigate those toxic effects. And there's, there is a huge study going on right now, 360 patients with maybe 10 or so uh, different uh, hospitals and universities are uh, evaluating these, uh, the, the outcomes. And so far, the preliminary results are quite promising. Interesting. So, so when you're talking about the use of hydrogen in these situations, are you, are you breathing it in um, or is it, is it a different delivery mechanism? And one of the reasons I ask is like, I've seen, like, I've been at medical conferences and health conferences before where folks have walked up and been, and, and had, like, these little tablets that dissolve in water and make little bubbles, and they'll drop them in my water and say, hey, you get, I'm hydrogenating your water. This is going to make it, you know, amazing for, uh, you know, as, as, like, an antioxidant or, or to get some of the other benefits that you were just talking about. Like, like is that sure. how, how the delivery is occurring in these studies? Well, yeah, so that, that's a great question. There's, there's several ways to deliver hydrogen. I mean, there's a hyperbaric chamber. And actually, just as a side note, there are actually hyperbaric chambers that are, have been developed now. It's like 2% hydrogen, and, and uh, you, know, you just get in the chamber and go through a the therapy. But then there's inhalation, uh, and that's like with a cannula, right, or a gas mask, for example. And you just, you, you know, in China, I was at one of, one of the medical clinics there, and you go in and you sit on in, in their chair in their clinic and you inhale hydrogen gas. And they're doing, there's probably 60 or so clinical studies that are currently in progress right now on, uh, on the use of the hydrogen gas inhalation. And then there is just simply drinking hydrogen-rich water. So when you, you can take hydrogen gas, just like CO2 gas or oxygen gas, and you can dissolve it in water. And now you have water that has hydrogen gas in it and this the solubility is about 0 0.8 millimolar or 1.6 milligrams per liter and by simply drinking the water that also gives remarkable therapeutic effects and it's and this is the interesting part too hmm. is you know you're going to get a lot more hydrogen gas from inhalation but that does not necessarily mean greater benefits and in fact in one of the studies uh, done actually at Nagoya University in, in 2012 with a Parkinson's disease model, they found that administration, continuous administration of hydrogen, inhal of hydrogen gas in the air, so 24-7 uh, they were inhaling hydrogen gas all the time, was not effective in preventing the development of Parkinson's disease in, in, the, in the animal model. However, the drinking of hydrogen-rich water was very effective. So in some cases, it appears that drinking hydrogen-rich water is actually more effective than inhalation. Now, we, we, there's been more studies and things have been done. There's different uh, you know, the pharmacokinetics alter pharmacodynamics. So there's many methods of administration. But what we do know from the clinical human studies and the animal studies is that, yes, drinking hydrogen-rich water is also very effective and maybe in some cases more effective and maybe in other cases not as effective. But we do need more research. So how would how would you actually make like a hydrogen rich water? Like what's actually occurring? Because water already has hydrogen in it, right? You, okay, yeah, that's something good to bring up. So yeah, water is H two O, right? It looks like Mickey Mouse have the oxygen and then the hydrogens attached to it. But that's that's the issue. They're attached to the oxygen. They're already bound up. I mean, look at glucose. The chemical formula for glucose is C six H twelve O six. So six carbons, H uh, twelve hydrogens, and six oxygens. Well, just because glucose has hydrogen in it doesn't make it the same as water or doesn't make it therapeutic for you, right? Th those hydrogens are all tied up or bound to the oxygen or to the other molecule. Pretty much every organic molecule out there has hydrogen in it. But we're talking about hydrogen gas. It's just just two atoms, two hydrogen atoms that are chemically bonded together. Okay. And that's the hydrogen gas. And that, and that gas can be dissolved in the water. So it doesn't – when you dissolve it in the water, it doesn't – alter the structure of the water it doesn't make like h4o or it doesn't so technically hydrogenation of water is 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 not true because hydrogenation suggests that 
that's going to attach to the water molecule. And that's not happened at all. It's just dissolved in the water. So to your question, it was, you know, how do you make right hydrogen water? Well, you can simply dissolve it. Just take like a tank of hydrogen gas and bubble it into the water. Um, you mentioned that about these uh, tablets, for example. The way the tablets work, that the, the tablets themselves don't contain hydrogen. It's not like that's impossible. Right? Hydrogen is a gas, the tablet is a solid. Um, but they're hydrogen producing tablets. So if you took it, the, the, the tablet, and there's other things out there too, you drop it in the water and it reacts with the water to produce hydrogen gas. Because like you said, water already has hydrogen. So the tablet, the ingredients in the tablet is able to basically liberate that hydrogen and, and it bonds together. And now you have hydrogen gas. So that's why, uh, have you, if you've seen the tablets, when you put it in, you'll see tons of gas bubbles being produced off of the tablet. And you could even light them on fire. You can see this is, this is hydrogen gas. Um, so that that's one of the ways that it, it can be done. Now, hydrogen is like an inert gas. Like, how, how does it even have any therapeutic effects? Like, how is it how is it actually working once it gets into your body? <laughs> yeah, that's why I got interested because, like, what the hydrogen gas? Yeah, it, it's 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 by it's kind of biologically inert. It's not inert like uh, helium or, or other the noble gases or something. But yeah, it's you know when you look at other gaseous signaling molecules in the body, such as nitric oxide. Uh, or uh, hydrogen sulfide or carbon monoxide, these these gases all have specific chemical properties that allow it to interact with certain receptors. I mean, nitric oxide is a free radical, so it's very reactive. Carbon monoxide is very polar, it's able to bind very strongly to the iron and you know part of the heme one oxygenase system or, or different areas. So these all have specific uh, capabilities to bind, but hydrogen gas doesn't really have this. It's this very small molecule it's it's nonpolar it's neutral so the mechanism of how it's actually causing these effects the actual primary targets are actually still elusive we we actually are not sure how it's happening but what we do see in this in the in vitro studies is that hydrogen gas can it acts as a cell signal modulator for example it's able to uh, activate the NRF2 pathway. So uh, maybe we should talk about that just, just a little bit. So the NRF2 pathway is, it's, uh, or the NRF2 is a transcription factor, and that when it is activated, it binds to the DNA, uh, to a specific portion, the ARE antioxidant response element portion, and it causes the basically the transcription of your body's own antioxidants, like you know glutathione, superoxide dismutase, catalase, you know, and, and, and several other cytoprotective enzymes and proteins. And this is critical. So this NR2 pathway is very protective, and it's one of the benefits of exercise or many supplements out there uh, because NR2 pathway can be activated and in turn upregulate the body's endogenous antioxidant and antioxidants. So hydrogen okay. somehow can activate that pathway. And we've seen it so many times in the studies – Using genetic knockout models, um, miRNA interference or pharmacologically uh, blocking the NRF2 pathway, what we see for sure hydrogen as a gaseous signal modulator is activated in this pathway, leading to these th th these effects. So this 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 signaling pathway that that it's uh it's deactivating this this uh it's it's the NRF2 that's how you that's you pronounce it. Yeah. Okay. Well, or NRF2. Yeah. Okay, yeah, the, the NERF too. That's right. So, in terms of affecting that pathway, would that pathway be something that is associated with the actual response to exercise, meaning exercise or, or something like that, would cause inflammation or oxidation, and then the body would upregulate things like you know mitochondrial enzymes and have you know basically like a, a fitness response so technically wouldn't hydrogenated water blunt the i mean wouldn't, wouldn't it be the same as the antioxidant or anti-inflammatory in terms of you needing to be careful with excessive exposure to it i see what you mean yeah so you're saying because when we exercise we activate these pathways and by taking normal antioxidants we actually negate or or abolish those effects the mm -hmm. benefits of exercise right let's Let's review, for, for our audience, let's just review some of the, that, and then we can answer the question very clearly. Um, it, it, is, it is essential when, when we consider free radicals and, and reactive oxygen species, it is true, as we all know, that 
they're linked to pretty much every disease and the pathogenesis uh, of them and their progression in you know, pretty, pretty much everything. I mean, when you cut an apple in half and it starts to turn brown, that's oxidation. And that happens every time we breathe oxygen. It, it causes an oxidation to our body. And but but at the same time, when we exercise, we are breathing a lot more oxygen and you know, between 0.1 to up to 2% of the oxygen that we inhale turns into free radicals, into reactive oxygen species. But these, just as you mentioned, these reactive oxygen species are critical in mediating the therapeutic benefits of exercise. And they, they, they activate transcription factors. They activate uh, mitochondrial biogenesis via upregulation of PGC1-alpha and a number of other other areas of uh, nitric oxide we just talked about. Nitric oxide is critical for the vasodilation and a number of other extremely important benefits, uh, but it's a free radical by definition. And uh, several studies have, have shown uh, that supplementation or ingestion of high levels of antioxidants uh, chronically can actually negate exercise training, uh, prevent the increased insulin sensitivity or even even uh, hamper the the increases in mitochondrial biogenesis. I mean, right, like high dose vitamin C or high dose vitamin E, for example. E- exactly. I mean, I mean, you know, it, it's it's sad, but you can imagine pe- people. Are, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna be healthy. I'm gonna get my vitamins. I'm gonna start exercising. You know, they do this for you know ten, twelve weeks, and they're like, man, I'm just I'm not in any better shape than I was when I started. <laughs> and maybe maybe it was because we're neutralizing these essential reactive oxygen species. But at the same time, what, at the same time, there are those free radicals that are toxic, that are damaging, and such as the hydroxyl radical or another oxidant, peroxynitrite. Peroxynitrite is is extremely damaging as well, very powerful oxidant, and it's formed when you have excessive high levels of nitric oxide and uh, and superoxide, and they react together to form peroxynitrite. But but if we look at superoxide for a little bit. Superoxide is critical in the production of uh, mitochondrial biogenesis. And it's it's specifically produced and, and, and specifically regulated under a tight homeostatic range. And when it kind of gets too high, then our body's enzyme uh, superoxide dismutase will basically convert that into hydrogen peroxide. And then hydrogen peroxide as an oxidant can, there's actually a specific aquaporin or, or a protein channel that hydrogen peroxide can actually transverse through and activate specific transcription factors to induce further cytoprotective benefits. And, and those levels are very tightly regulated as well, and it can be quickly neutralized by uh, glutathione peroxidase, a catalase, and a number of other antioxidants. So everything is very tightly regulated. But what happens is when we age or various environmental toxins, or maybe going out uh, as an untrained person and you're, you know, a weekend warrior, right? You're not trained. You don't have the the, the build up, the adapt, the cellular adaptations, and you push yourself really hard for a few hours. Or maybe you go run an Ironman or a marathon. You're not really trained for it. Or, or if you are an elite athlete and you're doing your best to really train and you're chronically trained in high intensity for prolonged periods of times, you're creating a lot of these very damaging free radicals that are above the level that our body can normally handle. And so our levels of, say, glutathione and superoxide dismutase and, and, and different things, they start to decrease, and then we start getting oxidative distress, and now we, we're at risk for infection, risk at risk for injury, we have more inflammation, we have all these problems. Okay, so now let's, let's consider uh, molecular hydrogen. Okay. Hydrogen gas does not scavenge or neutralize with these with these free radicals if it reacts with any radical the only possible radical radical that it can react with and neutralize would be the hydroxyl radical that that's that's the only one that is reactive enough so it's a it's like a selective antioxidant and in fact that nature medicine publication the title was hydrogen acts as a selective antioxidant by by reducing cytotoxic oxygen radicals. Okay, got it. And I'm going to interrupt you real quick. I'm going to yes. I'm going to hunt that down and link to it uh, over at bengreenfieldfitness.com/hydrogen if you guys want to want to delve into any of these research studies that Tyler's talking about. Oh, hello. I didn't know you were there. No, I did because you're listening to this amazing podcast. 
Uh, I'm interrupting today's show. However, I realize it's a brutal interruption, but uh, I'm interrupting because I want to tell you about this thing called Omax. Has nothing to do with orgasms, surprisingly, uh, since this is me talking, and I know I talk about all this sexual health stuff. Probably could help you with that. I mean, it's a, uh, it's actually um, here. Here's the deal. Let me start here. Consuming a bad fish oil, in my opinion, is worse for you than not consuming a fish oil at all. Consuming a good fish oil exposes you to a compound that is one of the most well-researched health compounds on the face of the planet. And this company, Omax, makes one of the most pure omega-3 fatty acid supplements on the market. It's got nearly 94% omega-3 fatty acids in just one of these capsules. They'll eat their, their um, what's called ethyl ester-based uh, meaning that uh, there there's no fish burps and uh, they're super effective at alleviating joint pain and muscle soreness. And they even have this thing called the freezer test challenge. It's pretty cool. If you freeze any other fish oil, it'll get cloudy because that's all the filler that gets cloudy. But the Omax gel stays totally clear, totally clear. Toss back a few with your smoothie, with lunch, with breakfast. Get a full dose of omega-3 fatty acids with no guilt and a 60-day money-back guarantee. It's not a bad fish oil. It's actually one of the best fish oils that exists. So here's how you get a box for free. You just go to omax.com slash Ben. That's O-M-A-X dot com slash Ben. That gets you a box of Omax Ultra Pure for free. Uh, terms and conditions do apply. Go to the website. Try omax.com slash Ben. O-M-A-X dot com slash Ben. Uh, this podcast is also brought to you by Onnit. So uh, I got a new thing, new thing for you to try. Uh, if you've never done club training or mace training, you are missing out on one of the best functional fitness moves and pieces of equipment that you can have. The other cool thing is I can use my mace or my steel clubs for body work, meaning that you can use these things to like dig into muscle tissue while they're sitting in your gym. So they kind of kill two burns with one stone. And the Onnit stuff, it's made from single machined pieces of steel. It looks good. You can put it in your living room. It's like a conversation topic. Uh, they also have the Onnit Academy where you can just go to learn how to use all these crazy tools in a very easy to understand and palatable manner. And um, their stuff is freaking amazing. Uh, the Onnit Academy on, on its own uh, advice from, from a bunch of pros like UFC champions and uh, entrepreneurs, professional hockey players. You can go and you can actually learn from folks who know how to use this stuff great website. So here is how you can get access to all that. Just go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash on it. That's bengreenfieldfitness.com slash O-N-N-I-T. That automatically gets you 10% off of anything from on it. So this study was in Science Magazine. It was looking into the anti-inflammatory effect. What did you say? Nature Magazine? Yeah, na yeah okay. Nature Medicine. Okay, Correct. Nature Medicine. So it was showing it has selective antioxidant properties. Is that how you described it? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, it selectively reduces just the cytotoxic radicals, not the beneficial really? radicals. Right. I've never heard of something that could actually do that before. Is that common? Not really, because typically if you have something that's a reductant, um, it's going to react or can neutralize pretty much anything. I mean, vitamin C, for example, great antioxidant, but maybe it's too great. Maybe it's too powerful type thing. So it can it can neutralize just like the studies you mentioned uh, earlier, neutralize those beneficial signaling molecules, and so now we're not, not, now we're not getting those those benefits mediated by the by the reactive oxygen species. But yeah, hydrogen gas it it is selective, and it's not going to it, it really just helps to maintain redox homeostasis. That's the way that I that I term it. Um, we we have to just like I said, everything is tightly regulated. Even hydrogen peroxide, superoxide, nitric oxide, those are all tightly regulated. And if those get too high, damage ensues. And hydrogen gas can help via its cell signal modulating effects help reduce those levels. Uh, for example, hydrogen can help downregulate the overactivity or hyperactivation of NADPH oxidase system, which produces mm -hmm. superoxide. So by downregulating or decreasing its activity, we have less superoxide production. And when the levels are, are so excessive that it's damaging to the cells, you follow? Yeah. 
Yeah, this is super interesting. So what about uh, the ability of it to affect other antioxidant enzymes, like say like glutathione or superoxide dismutase or a lot of these other pathways? Like for example, you know, a lot of folks will do genetic testing, right? Like I've done done my 23andMe analysis, and I show that I've got some SNPs that might downregulate that superoxide dismutase pathway. Uh, what, what would be the effect of hydrogenated water on some of these other antioxidant pathways? Yeah. Well, and, and just a clarification, we don't want to call it hydrogenated water, but maybe just HRW or, or okay. like for hydrogen-rich water or something. Hydrogen just because hydrogenated water. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. probably better because hydrogenated yeah it means it's like chemically bonded. But okay, uh, you know exactly what what we what we do see what we do know is hydrogen gas can activate uh, this NRF two pathway and leading to higher expressions of glutathione, superoxide dismutase, and catalase, and, and and induction of other cytoprotective proteins and enzymes like heme one oxygenase. But um, but the important thing about this is it only does it if it needs to be. This is a really big point and and, if, and it makes it very difficult to study hydrogen too. But if you were to take a normal healthy cell, for example, that has a, uh, a, that has a certain level of glutathione or superoxide dismutase, etc., and you give or administer molecular hydrogen to that cell or that tissue or that animal, you will actually see that the level of glutathione – does not change. It doesn't increase or it doesn't decrease. And and that's because it's already at normal homeostasis. That's where it needs to be. Okay. But as soon as you add a, 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 some sort of a toxin or an assault to that cell or that tissue or that animal, then the glutathione levels may decrease a lot. But the administration of hydrogen gas helps to maintain it where it's supposed to be in that homeostatic range. Okay, got it. Interesting. So it has, so it has a positive effect on the activation or the upregulation of additional antioxidant enzymes in addition to it being able to to affect that NERF2 pathway itself without actually blunting the natural hormetic response. Exactly. And maybe we can categorize this. Um, hi- hydrogen can help reduce the oxidative stress by one it's cell modulated effects in terms of decreasing excessive levels of radical production, such as the NADPH oxidase system or, or maybe uh, inducible nitric oxide synthase, which, which is, is very problematic if that gets too activated. Um, hydrogen can decrease that. In other cases, though, it can increase like ENOS, endocellular nitric oxide synthase, so we get mm-hmm. higher levels of nitric oxide uh, production. And so we have one, it's decreasing the ROS production because it's, 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 down regulating its production, preventing it from occurring. And then and then another is via this activation of the NRF2 pathway and leading to higher levels of the glutathione and superoxide dismutase and things, but but only to maintain this at the homeostatic level and not blunting the hormesis effect. And if we actually look at the clinical studies with uh, with hydrogen for uh, athletes. For, for example, there was one with elite soccer players, a double-blinded, placebo-controlled crossover uh, study, and drinking hydrogen-rich water. And they found that hydrogen was effective at preventing the early fatigue, decreasing the lact- lactate production, as well as just, just improving their all overall performance. But it did not decrease the markers of oxidation, which suggests that it's not going to blunt the those those therapeutic effects of or those, those hormetic effects of exercise. This is super interesting. Now one of the things that I noticed when I was over at your molecular hydrogen foundation website where uh, by the way for those of you wondering like Tyler doesn't sell anything on that website. He just studies molecular hydrogen. It was just fascinating. Yeah. Uh you're such a geek dude. Um, you, you, you talk about <laughs> the anti apoptotic effect, the anti cell death effects of hydrogenated water. Uh, and that makes me wonder, you know, when it comes to things like cancer, for example, if there's an anti cell death effect, would this, for example, be something risky to drink, you know, like eating too much dairy or taking too much like, you know, like growth hormone, for example, that it might be potentially too anabolic or, or keep natural cell death from occurring? I mean, I guess the best answer is we don't really know. Uh, what we can say is what we have seen in the research, um, that because hydrogen is selective like it is, 
uh, it doesn't. It may not have such that 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 effect on the cancer cells in in all cases, especially in a in a living uh, in a living person. And in, and when we look at the anti apoptotic effect, well, that's because we're preventing like the caspase activation earlier on in the signal in the signal transduction, or uh, and preventing the the, the uh, protein phosphorylation cascades earlier on. And that's resulting in anti-apoptotic or, or the prevention of uh, cytochrome C release or different things that cause the cell death. Now, if you're on the website, if you go to studies, then you'll see cancer is listed there. And there's a number of studies where it actually has shown that hydrogen could have a, a suppressive or inhibitory effect on various cancer cell lines, such as uh, colon cancer. There was uh, uh, pretty good in, uh, inhibition, inhibitory effect on, on the growth of colon cancer. And they've also done another study, a human study, is open-labeled and kind of small, but it's, it's still very good in with showing that hydrogen was able to help uh, negate some of the cytotoxicity or some of the damage that occurs with taking normal chemotherapy drugs. And that's that's a really important thing there because chemotherapy is so uh, harmful and damaging to the body. So hydrogen being able to mitigate those toxic effects, but not but not alter the anti tumor effects of the drug wow. is very critical. Why would something that's anti apoptotic, that's anti cell death, be a good thing? Because I thought like natural cell death was something we're going after when we say uh, fast, for example. Sure, but at the same time. Um, when you uh, okay, fasting for example has anti-apoptotic effects for normal healthy cells. It upregulates DNA repair mechanisms. It it enacts gastric ghrelin secretion, which is very neuroprotective. There's a lot of benefits from fasting, but fasting, as you know, is also can be beneficial for um, for for cancer inhibition because you're not getting the growth hormone signals or substrates that are uh, promoting cancer growth. So we we can't we can't look at it just because it's anti apoptotic. Well, we have to look at the, under which conditions is it anti apoptotic? Because in some of these studies, it promotes apoptosis, it promotes cell death. And um, when we look at specific things like cancer studies, it, it, for example, cancer shuts down the mitochondria from working. It does most of its metabolism through glycolysis. And the reason why is because the mitochondria actually works fine. It just shuts it down. And the reason why is because mitochondria are very smart. And if they realize the cell is cancerous, they will send out uh, cytochrome C. And that's a signal for apoptosis. So cancer shuts that down. And some of the chemotherapy drugs, what they try to do is actually inhibit uh, glycolysis, forcing the cancer to activate the mitochondria again and use the mitochondria to get its ATP, its energy needs. And as soon as it does that, then the mitochondria says, hey, man, we're, the game's over and, and, and it induces uh, apoptosis, a cell suicide. Well, hydrogen is very efficient at inducing mitochondrial biogenesis and upregulating the activation of the mitochondria, maintaining mitochondria membrane potential, a lot of benefits to the mitochondria. And so it's also possible that hydrogen gas administration to the cancer activates them, their mitochondria and then in turn the mitochondria you know, realizes it's, it's cancerous, the cell is cancerous, and mm -hmm. thus induces apoptosis, and th therefore hydrogen is very suppressive against cancer. So it's all how, it's under which conditions are we looking at it? You follow? Yeah, exactly. And it sounds like it has kind of like a cell signaling effect too. E exactly. And, and, and that's, oh, and so that's bringing us to cell signaling and this hormetic effect. So there was a study done, it's funny because I, 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 I knew this was the effect in 2013, but it was just published in 2017. And, and what they found is hydrogen does induce a hormetic effect in the initial stage. So you, they took and administer hydrogen gas to the cells, and you actually see very mild, small transient increases in superoxide production. And so hydrogen administration, just like exercise, slightly increases superoxide production and other free radicals. Kind of like that, uh, that, that SARMs that they talk about, the exercise in a pill that they give to mice. It sounds like, yeah. like this is kind of having a similar effect, except it's just water with extra hydrogen in it. Yeah, with hydrogen gas in it, it is it is kind of like a uh, exercise mimetic. If we look at the metabolic path, yeah, a mimetic, exactly, an exercise mimetic. Yeah, 
and 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 it really, if we look at the metabolic pathways that high that hydrogen activates and exercise activates, and we do some parallels, we do some we do some correlations here, we see exercise can activate, say, CERT three expression, which is amazing for exercise. So can hydrogen. Hydrogen uh, exercise increases the NAD plus to NADH ratio. That's your electron energy carrier system. Very important for anti-aging and for exercise. Hydrogen can also do that. Uh, exercise activates PGC1 alpha, which leads to uh, mitochondrial biogenesis and a number of other benefits regulated through uh, the, the PPARS peroxidome proliferator activator receptor. Hydrogen also increases PGC1 alpha. And we can keep going down the list of various transcription factors and pathways that are activated by exercise. And then we look and see, hey, hydrogen also activates these pathways and likely does it through its hormetic mechanism. That's really interesting. Okay, so when it comes to hydrogenated water, there's this concept, you know. That, or hydrogen-rich water. Or, sorry, I, got, I keep saying that. Hydrogen-rich water. I'd be careful, man. You can deadlift more than me. Uh, so, <laughs> so hydrogen-rich water. Um, there's this concept of alkalinity, right? A lot of people buy these countertop alkaline water makers. Uh, oh, what, sure. What What's the uh, What's the properties of hydrogen-rich water when it comes to to alkaline versus acidity? And is there is there any advantage to it from that standpoint? Sure. So, first off, uh, hydrogen gas has no effect on pH. It's a completely separate property. Okay. There's no correlation, no relation. If we look at pH, pH stands for potential of hydrogen. So you so it does it is kind of confusing. You're like, well, Yeah, that's why I was curious. Like what like how it would affect hydrogen levels. Yeah, so the higher the hydrogen, the more the higher the pH, but it's it's actually <laughs> very different. Um we, we can walk through this briefly. The, the the potential is is uh, or pa- is really means like powers and the exponent like the power of ten and in this case is the inverse of an exponent which is a logarithm and the hydrogen in H of pH is a hydrogen ion or the H plus so again hydrogen gas is H two neutral molecule two electrons H plus no electrons just a bare naked proton basically that's H plus so pH literally means the negative logarithm of the hydrogen ion concentration, which is completely different than this hydrogen gas that we're inhaling and we're talking about for therapeutic use. So you can take hydrogen gas and you can dissolve it into acidic water, alkaline water, or whatever. It'll have no effect on on the pH directly. It does not convert into protons and electrons. It's just it's just hydrogen gas and it stays that way. And then that's an interesting history because if we do look at the history of the alkaline ionized water or electrolyzed reduced water, is what it's called in literature. Right, what, what's, what's alkaline water called in literature? Alkaline ionized water in the literature okay. is called electrolyzed reduced water. Electrolyzed reduced water is the same as alkaline water. No, no. It's the same as alkaline ionized water. Okay. Because there's two ways to make alkaline water. You can make alkaline water just by adding some some baking soda or some sodium hydroxide, or you can make alkaline water through a an electrolysis machine. Mm-hmm. And the properties will be different. Not the alkaline properties, but the properties of the water will be different because when you do electrolysis of water, you make hydrogen gas. I mean, that is how you mass produce hydrogen gas is from electrolysis of water. That's your high school chemistry you know, experiment right there, right? You put the battery in the water and all of a sudden you start seeing bubbles, off, one off the cathode, the other off the anode, which is hydrogen and oxygen respectively. So when you when these alkaline ionized water uh, or these electrolysis units were making alkaline water, a lot of people were getting benefits thinking incorrectly, but thinking it was the alkaline a property of the water that was making them feel healthy. But really it was the hydrogen gas that was produced from the from the alkalizer from the electrolysis machine and and now many studies many studies have shown that when you take the hydrogen gas and remove it from alkaline ionized water or reduced water all the benefits are eliminated and and even even the the president of the Korean Water Society which is also one of our MHF advisors he's one of the pioneers in alkaline ionized water research uh, he he himself has done many studies showing that, yes, alkaline ionized water exerted these anti-diabetic and anti-cancer effects and a number of different things, but when the hydrogen gas was removed from the water, the benefits were eliminated. 
Hmm. And and this is this is also a critical finding because it it you know well the medical the medical community knew that the alkaline the alkaline claim was did never made sense and the scientists who did the research they never claimed the benefits for were from alkaline the alkaline property of the water because it doesn't make any sense to, to put it in comparison even if we subscribe to the concept that we need to alkalize our bodies and eat alkalizing foods or this kind of stuff even if we subscribe to that you cannot do it with alkaline water because alkaline water is not a buffer. In fact, uh, a comparison is if we look at baking soda, which is our body's natural buffer, uh, sodium bicarbonate, that's our natural buffer in our body. About We have about 10 millimolars of that. Well, if we do a comparison, about one teaspoon of baking soda can neutralize as much acid as over seven or 800 liters of alkaline water at a pH of 10. So, so these so, alkaline countertop water makers, uh, or even adding sodium bicarbonate to water, could alkalinize the water. But what you're saying is that the benefits of alkaline water would not persist unless somehow that water was also hydrogen enriched. And in the case of both sodium right. bicarbonate water and countertop alkaline water makers, those still aren't hydrogen enriched. Well, baking soda, adding baking soda to the water or other things that of course will never have any hydrogen gas in it and but the alkaline water countertop makers or the ionized water they can have hydrogen gas in it at least initially if you have the right source water and some people who have very low tds for example they we measured this you, you can you can measure the concentration of hydrogen gas with redox titration. the total dissolved solutes yes the tds yeah total dissolved solids and then i'm just saying we we've, we've measured the concentration of hydrogen gas produced via via very various of these uh, uh, these products out there it's very easy to do now and what we see is depending on the source water and depending on the on the ionizer the electrolysis machine you can have very good levels of hydrogen or very poor levels of hydrogen. And if you talk to the industry, if you talk to those who've been selling alkaline ionized waters for a long time, every single one of them will tell you this fact. It's best to drink the water fresh. And if for whatever reason, if you, they don't know, for whatever reason, if, you, if you're not cleaning your machine if, uh, or, or, or if you leave the water out for, for weeks or, or so many days, it seems like the benefits are not there anymore. Well, now we know the reason why is because the hydrogen gas is just dissipated out. It's 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 out of the water because it's just a gas. It's gonna it's gonna dissipate out. And the reason why is because yeah, they had hydrogen gas initially, but now you let it sit on the counter so long, and now it doesn't. So if you drink it right away, is it hydrogen enriched water? Like if I had like a Kangen countertop water maker or something like that? Exactly. Yeah. If you drink it fresh from the faucet. Uh, you know, and, and it's going to last for a, a little bit. It's not going to, you know, vanish within a blink of an eye type thing. But you can't leave it sitting out for weeks or something. Um, but yeah, that's the the hydrogen gas will be there, and then you can get some benefits. But the other thing though is if you live in like a, and that's only if you live in a place with with that has good TDS. If you have, you have to have like a hundred ppm uh, TDS or something in order to get the dissolved hydrogen. So you could what what if you add add like extra minerals and stuff to it before you put it through like a countertop water ionizer. That may work, but if you consider the filters, I'm not an I'm not an expert in this area, but but if you consider that if your TDS of your source water is say 20 ppm, and you're going to try to increase that to 100 ppm, you know, adding you know 80 more milligrams per liter of minerals, that's I don't think you can do that so easily. Hmm. You might it might be better off to move to a different source water with higher TDS levels. Would you drink ionized water from one of those countertop machines or do you? I have in the past. I, yeah, I actually, it's one of the ways I, it's one of the ways I know so much about this because I actually um, first got introduced to ionized water in 2009 and I started looking at the literature. I was like, man, this, this, maybe there's something to this because it doesn't, you know, the, the, what, what the claims people are making about the alkaline benefits, you know, of course doesn't, doesn't make sense, but there was research on it, and so I started evaluating that, and that's when I came across this hydrogen gas. So, yeah. you know, now now that we know the benefit is from hydrogen gas, well, for me, then why don't I just focus on what the benefit is? Because all those units, they were all manufactured and designed and optimized specifically for alkaline water, not not hydrogen gas. Yeah, I'm kind of careful with them, anyways. I don't I don't use them. My dad's he's big into water filtration techniques, and he informed me about 
some uh, some issues with metallic ions. I guess they pass some of that water over a metal plate, and metallic ions can be present in the water that you're drinking. And so you might get a buildup of things like mercury or lead or aluminum or copper, apparently, by drinking too much from these these countertop water ionizers. So I, I personally don't really use them. You know, I, just, I just drink my well water, and I have a couple of filters that that goes through, but... Yeah, I guess you, you you could always do it and just test your test your blood metals or your hair metals and see what happens. Well, it may not be so easily. Um, and I mean, they, they try to make them if they do them right, you know, try to make them good because they use, you know, a good platinum. Platinum is a very uh, inert electrode, but you could have alloy issues and you could have degradation of the electrodes and actually get platinum particles into the water. There's there's an ongoing, you know, it's an unknown thing. So, you know. Yeah. Okay. More needs to be done in that area. I yeah. yeah. I hear it. I want to ask you in a little bit about like where where you where you could find other sources or figure out a way to to make hydrogen enriched water. But I had a couple other questions for you first. The, uh, we have a lot of people who exercise who listen in, like you. Is there any effect uh, aside from the antioxidant or the anti-inflammatory effect that this would have on exercise performance? Have any studies been done on that? Um. Yeah, so there's I, there's the one that I mentioned earlier, and that was with the elite soccer players, and they found that hydrogen was able to uh, decrease their the uh, the fatigue level, and as well as decrease lactate or lactic acid production, and that's that's critical because that suggests that hydrogen is able to improve the efficiency of the mitochondria. Because when we exercise, we primarily re, well if it's aerobic, primarily rely on the mitochondria for ATP production, and then as we start to exercise more intensely or we start to get tired, we have to start relying on glycolysis and then we can start getting higher levels of lactate or people call lactic acid production, it's not lactic acid. But anyways, this because the study showed that the lactate levels were reduced even though the exercise intensity was the same, uh, that suggests that the mitochondria was functioning better. But there's other studies showing that uh, hydrogen was able to help improve like a soft tissue injury, like the recovery from, from uh, sports, uh, soft tissue injuries um, by taking hydrogen water. And there's also another study that was done out of Japan bathing in hydrogen rich water and helped prevent the, the uh, damage of inflammation and oxidative stress. Uh, it's, it's too much oxidative stress. Not, it was very interesting. The trend was a slight decrease in oxidative stress, but not again, not enough to to abolish the training benefits of that stress. But specifically, the article found that it decreased the delayed onset muscle soreness so that you, people could go and exercise again and continue getting these, the benefits of exercise. Um, I, I actually am involved in another study out of Japan where we're doing uh, hydrogen-rich rich water for uh, the performance in VO2 max increases in, in this study it increases in their in their exercise capacity and then i'm just finishing up another study that i'm i'm doing here and find i was looking for I was actually using the uh the hydrogen rich tablets um and found that there was there's a decrease in the submaximal exercise there was at least a trend in decrease in in the submaximal exercise the you know, heart rate so it's able to exercise Which would be a good thing yeah Im- improvement in exercise efficiency and economy I- exactly yeah interesting so, I, I, there, there needs to be a, more studies done. I mean, there's, there's, it's, it's still a very new area of research, but the safety of hydrogen is very high, and the prom, the preliminary results from animal and human studies is very, very encouraging. And there's some pretty neat studies that are coming out. They're really showing that I think it is a great thing for, for exercise. Either a to help prevent that excessive inflammation and oxidative damage that will hamper exercise performance, or and or maybe actually act ergogenically to mimic exercise and its benefits in, in inducing those transcription factors. Interesting. What about the effects of, uh, well, now, now that we know the effects on lactic acid, the fact that it can almost act as an exercise mimetic as well, improve exercise economy and efficiency. Um, I haven't, I, I found uh, some some websites that uh, sell hydrogen and rich water and they talk about uh, improvement in aerobic output in swimmers and then also uh, a halting of atrophy of muscle during detraining and then also what you alluded to you know muscle fatigue and lactic acid recovery so i've seen some of these studies what about another issue that a lot of people deal with and that would be the gut from what i understand like the the bacteria in your gut your colon i believe actually produce some hydrogen rich gas 
some people more than others, if you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> but uh, but what what's the deal with the effects of this stuff on our gut? Like if, if our gut already produces hydrogen gas, would there be more health effects for the gut by actually drinking it? Yeah, that, yeah that's a great question. I mean, and, and that, that, that is a number of things. First, the fact that the, the gut, the intestinal bacteria are already producing hydrogen gas further illustrates the safety of hydrogen gas. We're always exposed to hydrogen gas in our, in our cells, in our breath, in our blood all the time. So the administration of small amounts of more hydrogen gas is very safe for you. And, but, but then the question is, why is it still effective? Why are we seeing in these animal and these human studies that it's still effective even though we're getting so much more hydrogen gas from intestinal bacteria? Well, there's a couple reasons um, why. One of them is because the intermittent type exposure, just like most cell signal modulators, the, a pulsing type effect is going to be more effective, and we get that that way. And and we also see that uh, the route of administration by, by inhalation or drinking is just a different method of administration. And because these pharmacokinetics dictate pharmacodynamics, that's also going to alter the effects. And then as far as the micro, the microbiome, uh, there may be some benefits also could be one of the targets of hydrogen to actually improve the, the microbiota and the, the normal microflora, improving the optimal homeostasis. And maybe there were some studies in, in early studies that out of Russia, for example, I, mean, I don't I don't know, you know, how credible they are uh, or things, but there there is some interesting correlations from some good human studies and in, in some Parkinson's disease and and different things going on, looking at hydrogen-producing bacteria is lower in, say, people with the various neurodegenerative problems. And by taking hydrogen, we can maybe help improve the population of certain of certain bacteria or improve the homeostasis of the microflora to uh, cause an inhibition of the pathogenic bacteria and an hmm. increase in the beneficial bacteria. That's interesting. So that's why a diet that's rich in fiber, which would feed bacteria and assist with production of hydrogen gas, could also have a little bit of an anti-inflammatory effect. Sure. And, and, and it does. And we've seen this. In fact, the University of Florida and, and the, Bo the Forsyth Institute of Boston uh, Massachusetts with, with Harvard Medical School did a study a few years ago in 2009, an animal study, and they took uh, an animal, um, uh, a rat, and they, or maybe it was a mouse, but they, they administered lactulose, and they found that the lactulose administration produced a lot of hydrogen gas. Lactulose is a, is a fiber, non-digestible carbohydrate, but it produced lots of hydrogen gas, and it provided a uh, protective effect to the liver when a toxin was administered. But then they took uh, the the bacteria and they removed their ability genetically modified you know, genetic knockout study and removed their ability to produce hydrogen gas and put it back into the into the animals and the benefits of the fiber in this case were eliminated suggesting that the benefits are a lot of the benefits in this case again were mediated by hydrogen gas wow. and by administering the bacteria back in that could metabolize the lactulose and produce hydrogen gas that reinstated all the benefits. That's fascinating. I have one other question for you about the health effects. I noticed on your website that you talk about the fact that there may be some kind of like an anti-allergenic effect. How would that even work? Yeah, that was done. Actually, one of my friends, that uh, uh, Dr. Ito, uh, there in Japan in 2009, he's one of the first first studies to really show that hydrogen really acts as a cell signal modulator and when when we have this this uh, cascade of inflammation, we're we're getting an an, an allergy, for example, so allergic type reaction. Um, we're getting high levels of uh, in, pro inflammatory mediators such as uh, the various interleukin cytokines and myokine activity. And when they get really high, hydrogen can help to decrease them back to normal. And and, and it, it appears that it happens earlier, early on in the signal transduction process near the receptor interface and, and thus prevents this excessive uh, upregulation of the allergy response. And so these studies where, they're indu where they give like a LPS lipopolysaccharide to induce the neuroinflammation or other, uh, other types of inflammatory diseases, hygiene is very effective at, at preventing that allergic type reaction or that uh, it, that that infl inflammation, but again, like free radicals, 
we need inflammation as well to help mediate a lot of the benefits. The myokines or the, the cytokines that are produced from exercise, like interleukin-6, very pro-inflammatory and very damaging and diabetes and all sorts of things, but also very important for meeting the benefits of exercise. Well, hydrogen, on, again, only mediates or, de or attenuates the infl the, these inflammatory markers back into that, that homeostatic range and not so much that it's negating the benefits of, of the exercise or whatever we're, we're talking about. Do you know anybody who has like hay fever or any other type of allergies who have, who have tried hydrogen enriched water for something like that? I have heard, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm always very skeptical when I hear the testimonials, but I hear quite a few of them, people who have allergies, uh, for example, people who have asthma or, or like exercise induced asthma when they start taking the hydrogen, there's some really there's some really good effects. Uh, there's uh, there's a report from that company in uh, in Texas. Um, they're selling their hydrogen products, but there but there was somebody there, I guess, who who, who have documented their with with their, with their doctors. Really, it's a really neat st a little study that they have showing that the hydrogen has really improved their their asthma, their exercise induced asthma. Uh, significantly um so I, I think it's hmm. i think it's a great area to look at why haven't more why, why why don't doctors talk about this i mean i'm, I'm pretty steeped in you know the supplement and the fitness and the nutrition industry and i haven't really heard much about it before until uh, dr mercola mentioned it to me like why why isn't this more mainstream well i i just think it's a timing issue i mean if you look at nitric oxide when that it was known there was something amazing like this back in the 70s and then you know, it was finally, it finally won the Nobel Prize in the ni 1995 or 98 or something. But it still, nitric oxide is just now really receiving the press and the and and the discussions and the and everything and the awareness that it merits. Well, hydrogen gas, I, I mean, it's still in its infancy. We have so much more research and, and exciting things to discover and learn of how it's working. And there's only you know a thousand scientific publications or so, which which yeah maybe it's impressive for for just some therapeutic molecule or something. We have a thousand scientific publications, and and it has been shown to be effective in about 170 different human and animal disease models, and uh, essentially every organ of the human body. But we we do need more studies, and the the awareness is really growing exponentially, and the research is growing exponentially. So I just think because there's 7 billion people in the world and it's a quite a new area of research, it's going to take some time. And I, I predicted that a few years ago, in 2013, 14, I predicted that 2017 would mark the year of, of the awakening, if you will, in, in terms of people with st the influencers, people like you, Dr. McCullough, um, some of the big you know players, celebrity figures and professional sports teams, which... They, they would learn about hydrogen and then slowly start promoting that. And that's exactly what has happened. There's a number of uh, celebrities and professional sports teams and players and people out there that are using hydrogen now and talking mm -hmm. about it. Um, but it's just going to grow. It's going to slowly take some time. And so my 20, uh, 2027, another 10 years, I think it will be everywhere. I think doctors will talk about it all the time. I think it'll be a mainstream thing because it does not – it doesn't negate the benefits of some other therapy. There's no contraindications, and it is the molecule of life. I mean, it's what started the universe and life, the evolution of life. It's involved in everything, and now the biomedical research is really showing us how essential it really is. Yeah, it's interesting because you have like oxygen as being one of the main elements that we find super important for life, and hydrogen is on the other end, right? Like that's the balance between oxidation and reduction so you almost have like this yin exactly. and yang type of effect where everybody's talking about breathing and hyperbaric oxygen chambers and you know wim hof breath work and and it's all about yep. oxygen 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 but a lot of us aren't thinking about hydrogen so this is really really fascinating the other thing uh that i noticed was in some of the research they've looked at a lot of these i know this is kind of woo woo but like these healing waters right like these springs or these these curative waters you find around the world. I know there's some sites in Japan and, and Mexico and, and Germany, and we hear about sulfur a lot of the time. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong, like like a lot of these type of, of waters that people have turned to traditionally as healing waters have pretty copious amounts of this hydrogen in them. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know that a, a lot of them do. I know that some of them do, and it is very interesting uh, when you uh, when you go to the places that are really actually documented to uh, have some beneficial effects. You know, it could be as simple as people are drinking this water and it has some iodine in it, and they're they're getting better. But there are other things in there, like some of these spring waters. They they actually do have hydrogen gas in them, and they're produced either from bacteria or from uh, basalt catalyzed reactions. There's a number of mechanisms for how hydrogen gas can be in these waters. And you can, people have gone and measured them and you can get small amounts of hydrogen gas. And if you consider that you're, when you're, if you're bathing in the water, then the concentration does not need to be so high because hydrogen gas, it's the smallest molecule in the universe. It's smaller than oxygen. So when you're bathing in the water, that hydrogen gas from the water can diffuse through the cells of, of your skin and into your blood. And, and, and actually studies with bathing of hydrogen water have actually shown increases in, in blood levels of hydrogen as well as uh, the, the breath ex- exhalation. There's increased levels of breath hydrogen showing that hydrogen gas really is diffusing into the body and exerting these, these benefits. So it is very interesting when you consider this whole romantic relationship between hydrogen and oxygen, hydrogen, the, the, this primordial first element in existence and this balances the oxidation and reduction. And then when the two, hydrogen and oxygen, react together, you form the life-giving solvent water, as, which is the perfect balanced molecule. And, and now we're, we're learning about the benefits of hydrogen. That it, hydrogen, oxygen is essential for life, but it's slowly killing you, slowly oxidizing you, just like that apple that turns brown. I, I interviewed Patrick McCone, who wrote The Oxygen Advantage, and a big part of that is you actually focus on breathing less, right? Like a lot of light nasal breathing and controlling respiratory frequency for the reasons that you've just described, excess oxygen. It's why you know too much exercise <laughs> equals too much too much oxidation, right? Too much inflammation. And, and one of the reasons for that is muscle damage and inflammation, of course, and another reason is just excessive oxygen intake. So yeah, it's it's really interesting, and and I I wanted to ask you because I know we're we're getting a little long, and I want to make sure I, I have a chance to to talk about where you might be able to 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 find like sources of of hydrogen rich water or or make it. And uh, I'm curious, like how much you'd actually have to drink? Like in these studies, are we talking about like gallons a day? Um, is there a dose response effect? I mean, how much do you actually need to use? Yeah, that's a great question, and and I think the research we need to have more research to really answer that specific question, how much do we need to use? Because the the amount, the dose, different based on age, the the weight of the person, the ethnicity, the genetics, whether their 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 diet, their microbiota, which disease it is, and some diseases they're maybe maybe they need a lot more. I mean, if we look at rheumatoid arthritis, for example, they with those studies they used a higher concentration of hydrogen, like uh, five milligrams uh, per liter, but in other studies, you know, something closer to one milligram uh, per liter of concentration uh, is is enough. And so, the 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 IHSA, International Hydrogen Standards As- Association, which I'm a director of as well, we just had some more uh, meetings and we released our official proceedings on what we're uh, setting as a as a, as the initial standard based simply based upon the current human studies, what have been shown in the current human studies to be effective. And it's looking like at, at a minimum level, you need about 0.5 milligrams of hydrogen a day. And likely taking more specifically for different diseases is, is better. And because a higher concentration is not ever less effective than a lower concentration, then, then often it's a good idea to just get a good dose of hydrogen and and that should be good that should be worth where things are at hmm. now a lot of these websites they they sell so we talked about the hydrogenated the the hydrogen tablets on like amazon for example as hydrogen tablets and you said you've used those before but did you say that, that those tend because hydrogen is so inert those tend to to come off the water very quickly i mean are those an effective source of hydrogen and rich water versus I, I know there are other companies that will sell like bottles of of hydrogen enriched water that are they're already bottled, already hydrogen enriched. Like, do you use these pills at all that you can just buy off of Amazon, the, the tablets? Yeah, I mean, it, it depends. It, de- it you know, it all depends because there's a lot of maybe a scam products out there and and different things. I mean, there's tablets that work, there's tablets that don't. There's ready to drink product pouches and another even plastic bottles. 
that work and some don't. Of course, if it's in a plastic bottle, it's it's not going to work at all uh, because hydrogen gas is, will mm. diffuse right out of there. So it needs to be like like a can or a glass. Yeah, I mean something. Yeah, like a, aluminum, a, an aluminum uh, container of some sort is known to help keep the hydrogen gas in in the water. It doesn't. It, the physical chemical properties are are such that it doesn't diffuse right out, such as it would with uh, plastic containers. Okay, there's the one of the brands that I've come across is this. Uh, it's it's H two. Uh, I believe it's called H two Rejuvenation. They're like these effervescent tablets that you dissolve in water. Have you used these before? Yeah, I, I know of those ones as well. So yeah, you can test. You know, you can easily test the concentration of hydrogen. What do you mean? How do you test? Well, there's a there's a redox titration reagent called H two Blue okay. from H two Sciences okay. Inc. Um, and and you can you can use that and you can actually measure the concentration of hydrogen in various products because there's a lot that say oh we make you know one ppm or or one point six ppm or something but uh, actually they don't it makes hmm. a lot less or even none so you'd want it you'd want to get these strips these reagent strips and you could actually measure it to see if it really does have hydrogen in it they're drops they're reagent it's a liquid it's okay. A, it's a, okay got it now another company that I found sells these things by the can. Um, that this one is called, uh, H, uh, two Bev, H two Bev molecular hydrogen drink. Have you used that one? Yeah. So I've also tested that one. I mean, I'm trying to be very vague cause I, you know, yeah, we, we I know. Don't... You, you have to, you have to stay as the, uh, the, uh, the scientist, right? The, uh, the unbiased yeah, scientist. We don't, we don't, yeah. There, there's so many products out there and things. Some of them work well. Some of them don't. We're just, you know, we're, we're, we don't make, we don't sell things. We don't make uh, recommendations or endorsements for the products. Um, you know, that one is, is in a can. And, and, you know, I, I guess I did mention earlier that that's one of that, the anecdotal report that I, I, w- I saw with the asthma. And, and so there we, you know, they, they have, a, they have a good product and you can measure the concentration that comes in the can. And, you know, they have different, they have different beverages like a nitric oxide, you know, beet, uh, or something product it's really great for performance and some of the different flavors so it's not it's not just water uh, it's a good refreshing drink if you will but there's other there's other products out there and other cans and other um, pouches and things as well um, you can always hmm. you know measure the concentration with that uh, h2 blue reagent and and see where, where it's at interesting okay well what i'll do for people listening in um, I'll hunt down some of these tablets, some of these cans, uh, some of these uh, these these testing drops, and uh, the other resources that Tyler and I have brought up, including his website for the Molecular Hydrogen Foundation. If you want to delve into this even more, I'm personally fascinated by this, absolutely intrigued. And you know, Dr. McCall is one of my friends, and I certainly um, I put a lot of trust in in much of what he has to say as well. And so. I'd, that sounds bad the way I say it. I, I I put a lot of trust in what he has to say. Let's put it that way. So I'm I'm going to experiment with this a little bit myself, and I'll kind of let you guys know what I get as far as results, whether I self quantify or throw down some hydrogenated workout before I swing or some uh, some hydrogen enriched water, I should say, before I go swing the kettlebells. Oh, there you go. So, um, Tyler, in the meantime, thanks so much for coming on the show and sharing all this stuff with us, man. This is absolutely fascinating. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you're, you know, everyone's welcome to check out the website, molecularhydrogenfoundation.org. I'm not much of a social media person, but if you look me up on Facebook, I, I every once in a while do post some of the new studies that, that we've, we've, we've done and uh, some of the different uh, conferences and symposia that, that I've been at. Um, but please, if you have your questions with products and different things, you know, talk to, talk to Ben or, or things that we just, we don't, you know, really make those recommendations or things. We just try to really focus on the research on, on what's out there. All right. Awesome, man. Well, you're a wealth of knowledge and, a, and one smart cookie. So I'll put links to all <laughs> this stuff over at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash hydrogen. And Tyler, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. All right, folks. Well, until next time, I'm Ben Greenfield, along with Tyler Leberon, signing out from bengreenfieldfitness.com. Have an amazing week. You've been listening to the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. 
Go to BenGreenfieldFitness.com for even more cutting-edge fitness and performance advice.